Well, welcome to lesson six in our biblical theology course of starting point. This, of course, means we move into the New Testament. There was a gap between the Old Testament to the New Testament around 400 years. Then we see the coming of Jesus Christ and then the record of the life, death and resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. The Gospels are the centre of what the Bible message is. Uh, there they have actual Christ himself. And there's four Gospels, but we're just looking at the first three today. This is something historically that people have done. We call them the Synoptic Gospels. And so when you open up, you see that word, uh, Synoptic Gospels. That's because uh, they can be put together. And even very early in the church, uh, people would compare uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they would uh, use the same material. But all have a slightly different emphasis. I'm not going to get into the textual criticism and the ideas of uh, redaction, the editor and how that moves the information around and the two-source hypothesis and source Q, where is it, how did it influence Matthew and Luke. That, that's a part of New Testament studies, you have to go through that, but I've been through all that and I believe that we have God's Word uh, before us in Matthew, Mark and Luke. They present the same message and we don't need to be afraid that what we have is a lot of contradictions here. We just need to understand the nature of the writers. So we're going to look at them separately. First Matthew, then Mark, then Luke. And you'll realize as you're going through that, that what they are teaching is, is consistent. They, they all are agreement. Uh, they're all are in agreement on the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's look first at Matthew. Matthew 1, 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. From that first verse you can see uh, where Matthew's heading. Matthew goes back to a genealogy and says, Jesus is not coming into a situation that hasn't been prepared for him. He is coming to fulfill promises that God has made for a long time to his people Israel and the Jews. And so from the very beginning, Matthew's specific emphasis is Jewish. And when you read Matthew, it's best when you have an understanding of the Old Testament. You start to understand what he means in this sense of fulfillment. But even if you don't understand the Old Testament, by reading Matthew, you understand the link between the Old Testament into the New Testament. Jesus is going to fulfill the promise made to David that God will establish an eternal kingdom through his king, but it will be King Jesus. Jesus will come and fulfill the promises made to Abraham that his descendants will be as the sands of the shore and the stars of the sky, that God will establish a people for himself, a great multitude. And he shall dwell with them and be their God, and they shall be his people. This is the beauty of, of Matthew. We see Matthew is a book that brings God to his people through Jesus Christ. You don't have to go far to get this idea of fulfillment with Matthew. Matthew stresses this more than any other writer. Matthew 1, verse 22, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. So Matthew is saying in Jesus' life, it's not just happening randomly or by chance, but it's fulfilling what the prophets looked forward to. Abraham looked for the day of Christ. David looked for the day of Christ, the Messiah. And the birth of Jesus fulfilled the promise of Isaiah 7.14. The virgin will give birth with child. Sorry, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
So, there's fulfillment, and by fulfillment we cause me Old Testament fulfillment. And this goes on uh, further and further in chapter 2. Uh, for what was written in the prophets, they talk about, and uh, through Jeremiah was fulfilled. And so, so Matthew is going on and on. And it says um, in the end of chapter 2, So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called the Nazarene. And for it is written, so, so Matthew is writing like a Jewish person. He says, here are our sacred texts, and I'm showing you from the sacred holy text that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he goes on to show Jesus in, in deed, in acts of deeds. He does the miracles. He, he, he casts out demons. He has authority over nature. He calls people to himself and they follow. And plus, but, words. And Matthew's almost set out like uh, the rabbinic Jews, you know. Here are the deeds, here are the words. So from chapters 5 to 7 we have the beautiful Sermon on the Mount. Now it's just wonderful to go through that and see Jesus' call of discipleship. And it's not saying that Jesus stood on the Mount and said all these words exactly like that, but but as the Jews would write in those days, uh, Matthew puts it all together as teachings of Christ that are preserved for God's people to take as God's instruction. And, and so, you know, you can spend a, a long time going through uh, the rich content of the Sermon on the Mount. Then it goes into Jesus uh, doing deeds again. And he sends out... In chapter 10, he sends out, he goes into another word thing where he sends out the disciples and talks about the mission. And John the Baptist, then he goes into issues of the law, uh, parables and so forth. And finally, he gets to a large discourse about the end of the Jewish nation and the beginning of God's new people, uh, those who follow him. And God's nation and people end essentially with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which is quite interesting because what Matthew is wanting to say is that to the Jewish people that the Old Testament did not fail, but it succeeded in Christ. And so we have this dualism in Matthew. We have the Jewish leaders, on one hand, who are against Jesus, and then Jesus. And the decision for the reader is, what is the truth about the promises made to Abraham and David? Is it true that these promises belong to Israel? Or now that Jesus has come, are these promises fulfilled in Jesus and they now belong to the followers of Jesus? Well, in 70 AD, the temple is destroyed, as Jesus says. The old covenant is over. And... The way to God is through Jesus. In the very end of Matthew, after Jesus dies on the cross, he rises again. Jesus says in his final words, Lo, I am with you always. And that ties back to Matthew 1, 23, which we read, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And in the end, lo, he is with his people always. The, to be with God is to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament didn't fail. Matthew is, sh is shining a great victory in Jesus Christ. The promises of the Old Testament are yes and amen. And the thrill for the reader is to have faith in Jesus Christ and to be as Simon said in Matthew 16, 16, when Jesus says, Who do you say I am? That's, that's Jesus' question to us as we read Matthew. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so, here's where we have Matthew presenting to us uh, Jesus Christ for us to believe in Him and know His truth. We then go to Mark. And Mark commences with these words, the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, John a special genre of writing called a gospel. 
uh, it's salvation history. It's, it's history, but it's put in the form of teaching us uh, truth of God's salvation. Gospel means good news. It was the proclamation that a king had won a battle and brought about peace for his people. That idea of good news. Mark doesn't write with all this fulfillment Jewish terminology and, and teaching, Jewish sort of teaching strategy. Mark is very bold and straightforward with his idea of immediacy. And so it's often been called apocalyptic. What do we mean by apocalyptic? It's as if Mark comes and there's a curtain to God's mystery. What is going on about in this world? And Mark opens it up and says, look here. Here's the truth of God's mystery. In the Old Testament you're wondering, what's God doing? There's good times and bad times. There's this upheaval of human society. What is the end of the matter in all this? And Mark is opening the curtain and saying, here, here is the mystery of God revealed to us. It is Jesus Christ. And this is seen Mark 1, 15, when Jesus said, The time has come. It's apocalyptic. The time has come. And now, immediately, make a decision. Don't delay this. This is urgent. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. What's more important than anything is the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And later Jesus says, come follow me, this idea of following Jesus. Uh, God has now acted in Jesus Christ, his son. And so in Mark 1.12 it says, at once the Spirit sent him, this idea of immediately they went here and that. So we see this idea of, of things moving very quickly. And so we, we have this in Mark, this apocalyptic uh, strong point. Now, there's, there's more to Mark, of course, than that. Uh, that another point in Mark is very much to see that Jesus did not come with a sense to destroy, but he came himself to be a saviour, to die on the cross. And Mark 8, 31 is a real important point where... It says, He, that is Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again. And here we see the great power of what is the central point of Mark. That is the cross. And Mark really shows us that the mission of Jesus was to go to the cross. This hardly seems good news of victory. But in that, Mark has picked up on Isaiah 53 that the sinless, the sinless servant of God must suffer and himself die in place of his people to take their sin. So Mark very much has that atonement, sacrifice for sin idea running through his book. That idea of then taking up the cross of Christ. That, that idea of serving. That idea of renouncing this world, repenting of sins of this world, and embracing the good news of Jesus Christ. So who is the audience of Mark? Well, Mark was an evangelist. He went with Paul, but then, of course, Paul didn't want to go with Mark again. Then Mark went with Barnabas to Cyprus. And we're told in history that Peter himself would have supplied, really, Mark's information. So it would seem Mark being a Jew and bent towards that way would be more for the Jewish people. But actually... It, being apocalyptic, it also shows that uh, Mark probably is interested in, in the, the world, the Roman world at the time, that sense of urgency, 
of coming out of the world for people who are anywhere. And so we have uh, really a sense of the unsaved in the whole world. But Mark really is trying to say that you know there's, there's people who are not saved, people of the world, and there's a sense of he wants that gospel to remind us that you know there is a call for people to repent and to believe. Mark 15, of course, has the cross, and it's a very cross event, and it's written in such a way that we sort of understand it uh, as, as Jesus opening that curtain. It's very interesting. Uh, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, so he dies, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And there's this sense that Jesus has opened up the, the relationship with God now. The, the, the hidden God who people couldn't come to in their sin, they can now come to. And then there's this mysterious resurrection. And then Mark at the end from 9 to 20, well, people have their doubts of how much is in there and that. But, but this just fortifies uh, Jesus is Lord now and sending people out everywhere to tell that good news. So it ends in a victory in this sense. Okay. We look at Luke then. Luke was a Gentile. So in Luke, we have a Gentile writing to a Gentile. Let's read Luke 1, 1 to 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And God is gracious to give the world not only Matthew and Mark, but also we've got Luke to give us the certainty of these things. Luke was a doctor, and we see his nature as a historian too. When you go to Luke chapter 2, we see how as a Gentile, as a Greek, he writes to the, to the whole Roman world. Luke 2 verse 1, In those days Caesar Augustus, he mentions the emperor, issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So he's bringing in people from Greece, from Egypt, from Rome, from Babylonia, different places would, would have an understanding. Wow, this is set concrete in world events. He even makes a little note, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So he's even making little notes to say, this is the, this is the historical fact. But then where does he get his, then he suddenly goes into shepherds and angels, which suddenly is very much a Jewish understanding. But of course as a Gentile, believing in Jesus, he's taken upon an understanding of, of the truth of the world with, with angels and so forth. And as he's seen it. But he's not making this up. Where is he getting it? From sources. And he gives a hint there in verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So he got some of the Christmas account that Luke writes from Mary. So he's included that in there. He would have used Matthew. He would have used Mark. He would have used other sources. He may have, John as well, had some source there. And other apostles that we don't know about. had a minor interruption. So where was it? Other apostles he didn't know about. So, oh, well, he knew about. But other apostles were not told about. But that's what I mean. So in Luke, we have that specific uh, writing towards the Gentiles. And people mean a lot to Luke. We can see that there is a sense of the, the type of people Luke is dealing with is very important. He's he mentions people that, that the other Gospels don't. 
certainly, we, we see that idea of Martha and Mary, the, the women, you know, the outcasts, the, the, the outcasts, we see Zacchaeus, and, and uh, then you also have the, the sinner at the back of the temple saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, the woman uh, who um, washes Jesus' feet with the hair in Luke 7. And um, very many, the, the sinners and the outcasts, the poor, the, the, it's, as a physician, as a doctor, is almost looking at, at the sin in people's lives and, and that Jesus comes to be a healer of that sin. Certainly people say that, that, you know, Luke doesn't seem to equal Paul. Paul's very much on the legal justification by faith. And Luke seems very easy. Jesus just goes to people, oh, your sins are forgiven. Do this work. Love the Lord your God and others, and that's okay. And, but, see, they, they miss the point. Luke is very much set on this word, uh, grace. Grace. And why is that so? Because... The whole of Luke's theme, I believe, is taken from Isaiah, where Isaiah says there's hope for the Gentiles. And so Luke is a, is a gospel of hope for those who really don't have any other hope. You know, the Gentiles are outside God's people, and Jesus is bringing hope to the Gentiles. And he does that through grace. And when you go to Luke 15, you have the beautiful story of the prodigal son. And he does everything wrong. He ruins the inheritance of his father and squanders it on immoral living. He ends up in a pig pen, the lowest place for a Jew. And then he says, I'll go back to my father. And then the beautiful thing is the father sees him coming and takes him and puts his robes on him and puts a party on for him. The beginning of that parable, before that parable, Jesus is sitting at the table with uh, sinners. And so it shows grace, Jesus, that willingness to come into the, the situation of sinners and bring them forgiveness of sins. And that is by the mercy of God. That's not, not against Paul's doctrine. Luke is very much in agreement. He's giving the account of Jesus for the Gentiles. And the sinner in, in the temple is saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knows he's not saved by his works. He is saved by the grace of God. So, so Luke is very strong in that. The other point then is, is the way Luke has structured his gospel also is to go to the cross, to see the, the cross and the resurrection as essentially important. Now Luke has 24 chapters, it's the longest of the gospels, and from 951, that's not far into the gospel when you've got 24, 951 is not far in, this is what he writes, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Once again we see Jesus going for Jerusalem very early on, and the whole momentum is this sense that he must go to Jerusalem to die. The cross, once again, being very significant, and the resurrection, and then the ascension. And so, Luke has that also. Now, all three Gospels show Jesus as Son of Man, as the one who is Christ, the, the one who comes from David, to be king, and, and that he is a flesh of our flesh. There's no doubt about that. Some scholars might say, oh, they don't really talk much about Jesus being son of God. But in evidence, really reading through it carefully, we see that all three Gospels are in agreement that Jesus is son of God. And it's not a title that any of them avoid. They're all in agreement of the person of Jesus Christ. Here is God with us in the flesh, Jesus, Son of God. They do all have a bit of a different angle on Jesus, but it's not so significant. And, you know, it does, people do debate about it. But I would say uh, Matthew, if, if his real angle is, is of course the Christ. So, and that, that of course goes because Matthew is Jewish, saying, Here is your Messiah. Here is the one who fulfills everything and brings the promises of God uh, to victory. Yes and amen are the promises of God in Jesus. Mark, uh, you would see the idea of the servant king. 
Uh, Jesus has come into history to serve this world by being the sacrificial offering of his life as kings for the salvation of his people. So, so Mark very much has this idea of Jesus, the one coming to serve and bring salvation to reality. Luke also uh, sort of looks at this great act of salvation for the Gentiles as saviour. He is a saviour from uh, sin. He is one that the broken and the poor and the downcast can go to and find hope. Hope of the nations. So they all have a bit of a, a, a different angle, but they much more have commonalities in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why did God give us three Gospels, three Synoptic Gospels? There is a sense of the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we have the three witnesses to confirm that this is the truth of God. You know, archaeologists say, oh, where's all the evidence of Jesus? But, but what's written here is the power and evidence of Jesus. Uh, and Jesus didn't mint coins or make statues of himself, of course. Here is the Christ we know, the Christ of history, the Christ of truth. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we have that. There's also the sense of the heart of God's call for people is not just to say, oh, I believe, put the book down, put it aside, I believed in Jesus. But we see the ending of all, is all the Gospels, is telling us something about a response to the Gospels. The Gospels is all about evangelizing, proclaiming the good news. And God has put these three Gospels to excite the believer to go and tell the good news. Look at the end of Matthew, what we call the Great Commission. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. So Matthew has his big, Go and make disciples of all nations. And Mark, when we go to the end of Mark, what are we left with? We're left with a, a Great Commission there too. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creatures. Go. And then we go to Luke. After the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and he's ascending, what, what does he tell them at the end? He said that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, you are witnesses. So it's there saying, witness, get out there to, to all nations, to all creatures. Yes, there we are, to the whole world. Uh, we are to go and bear witness. You run in the church today, are people really getting out there and evangelizing? What's the problem? The problem is we're not getting in to the Gospels. As we read the Gospels and are enriched by the Gospels, become a people that, that are not introverted, thinking, oh, well, how's our life going? But you become uh, outward thinking. And you want to go out and tell other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the whole uh, passion that runs through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't want to leave a bunch of people uh, sitting in pews in the church. It wants to have people out there on mission and evangelism. That's the finality of it. Okay, so thus ends uh, the short lecture on the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, 